Okay, so we've started to talk about mirrors, and we started to understand that as we take a look at a plane mirror or a flat mirror, that we get kind of this, this perfect virtual image behind it that's the exact same distance, everything's to the same proportions, and everything else like that appearing behind the mirror. And that's because all of the rays are reflecting at the exact same angle from this flat, perfectly flat surface. But what if that surface isn't flat? What if that surface is curved? Well, then we're going to have some stranger things happening. We're going to take a look, first of all, at curved mirrors, and then we're going to take a look at rough surfaces and how some of these impact the way that those light rays get reflected. Now, keep in mind that our law of reflection doesn't change. Our law of reflection stays completely the same, and actually, in understanding our law of reflection better, we can understand better how these curved mirrors and rough surfaces work. Remember that our law of reflection stated that the angle of incidence has to equal the angle of reflection, or the other way around. Either way works, that that angle stays consistent based on what angle it hit the surface at. So in a store or on a bus or in lots of other places in the world around us, we've probably seen mirrors that bulge out. Well, these are called convex mirrors, mirrors that curve outward. Um, or mirrors that are kind of thicker in the center and thinner on the outside. Kind of think about those security mirrors that are sometimes up in a store in uh, the upper corner so that the store owner can see all different angles of the store at the same time. This is a convex mirror, mirrors that are curved outwards. However, we also have some mirrors that are caved inward. And we call these concave mirrors. I like to remember this because they seem like they're mirrors that are caved in or they're curved inward in the middle. We're going to be unpacking this a little bit more, but one of the key examples that we can see both of these in play is just to take a spoon. If you take a spoon, a nice shiny metal spoon, you, depending on which side you're looking at it, you can see either an example of a concave mirror or a convex mirror. Looking at the back of the spoon and looking at the part where it's curved outward, you're taking a look at a convex mirror and you can see what that does to your reflection. Flip it over and look at the inside of the spoon and you see a concave mirror and you can see how that influences um, the reflection as well. When we have a concave mirror, we can actually use them for a number of different things. We can use them to focus a particular image. When we have a convex mirror, it allows us to be able to see uh, a wider range or a wider variety of things. And that's because this is what's happening to those light rays as they're hitting those particular surfaces. If we take a look at the convex mirror, Notice I have three light rays that are coming in here, one at the center, one above, and one below. The one in the center, it's coming and it's hitting the mirror exactly dead on 90 degrees, and so it's bouncing off exactly dead on 90 degrees straight back. That one's not really changing. But take a look at what's happening to the upper ones and the lower ones. As they're hitting the mirror, they are bouncing off at that same angle. Notice how they are still following the law of reflection, but this time it's a little bit different because the angle that they're hitting the mirror at is different than the center one because the mirror curves. And because of that, the reflected ray goes further apart. The reflected ray spreads out. And so oftentimes when we're taking a look at a convex mirror, we are taking a look at things that have um, a wider view than what they normally would have. And it might be a little distorted. It might not be completely accurate because you're starting to spread apart some of these images. Some of the proportions of things will look off, but it gives you a wider view of what's going on. Concave mirrors, on the other hand, they do exactly the opposite. Sort of. Concave mirrors are interesting. <laughs> if we take a look here, the center one here, it's hitting it dead on, bouncing straight back dead on, no change there. But let's take a look at the upper and the lower ones. 
Because it's curved inward instead of outward, as it hits this part, it's reflected back, still using the law of reflection, um, but now that image is coming closer and closer. So we'll get to this a little bit later on, but we have this weird point right here where they actually meet and they cross together. So what's going to happen is that that image actually gets focused to that point and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. But then a really strange thing happens past this focal point and that is that the image starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger again, but it's flipped. So think about it this way. If I had a happy face that's here and it's reflected off, let's say the eyes are the top line and the mouth the bottom line. As it's reflected back, we get a smaller and smaller happy face. But past this point, the happy face will start getting bigger again, but upside down. And this is something that's really, really interesting for how concave mirrors work instead. When a mirror cannot focus an image on a screen, um, but you can see an image when you look at through the mirror, that image is called a virtual image. And that's the images that are being created beyond this mirror um, that we're sort of imagining we're seeing. Convex mirrors form images that appear much smaller and further away than the object. However, they can reflect light from a larger area. Therefore, convex mirrors are often used as security mirrors in stores. Often one clerk in a small convenience store can see everyone in the store in a single mirror. For the same reason, convex mirrors are sometimes used on the passenger side of a car. It allows us to see uh, a larger view of what's out there. Although these images are a little distorted, the driver can see many of the vehicles that are behind it because of the nature of that curve. So. Near the beginning of talking about light and reflection, we talked about how one model of reflection could explain both the images we see in a mirror and an image on a page that we're reading. Let's take a look at how that really works. So here I have two examples again. I have reflection on a smooth flat surface and reflection on a rough surface. To see what happens when uh, to see what happens when light strikes a rough surface and to see what happens when it strikes a normal surface, we need to take a look at the law of reflection. The smooth surface reflects light very uniformly. And what that means is that right, we have light that's all coming at the same angle and it's all reflecting back at the exact same angle too. And so we have a smooth, flat, reflecting surface. If we pick out several lines, several tiny flat areas, we're going to see that it's all reflected back the same way. And so the image is not going to appear different at all. It's just going to uh, reflect all back all together at the same time. However, here on our rough surface, looks what's happening. All the rays are coming in at the same angle, but based on where they're hitting the surface, they're bouncing back at different strange angles. If we pick out several tiny flat areas on a rough surface, we'll see that normal light, uh, we'll see that the normal line goes in many different directions, right? Here the normal is straight up and down, here it's a little bit to the right, here it's a little bit to the left. And those are all just because the surface itself has different angles and bumps and changes to it. Each light ray that strikes the surface will reflect according to the law of reflection. However, since the normal lines all point in different directions, the reflected rays will go in different directions too. The result appears as though the reflected rays were scattered randomly and therefore they can't actually form an image. And this is one of the reasons why when we take a look at a sheet of paper, when we read a book, we're not seeing the reflection of our own face in that piece of paper. Because even though it might look super smooth, it actually is, is a very rough reflecting surface. Let's take a look at another example here. Here we see how this seemingly scattered light creates the image of the print on a page. Light hitting the white paper reflects in all directions. Some of that light reaches our eye. Since there's no pattern, our eye just sees white light. The ink on the page, though, absorbs all that light. 
none of the light that strikes that ink is reflected. We're actually going to get into this a little bit more when we talk about color and how color and light interact together. N um, since no light reaches our eye from the ink, your eye sees it as black. And again, we're going to unpack a little bit more about that as we uh, get further into this unit. So now let's take a look at using reflections and how we can use reflections or reflectors in different ways. Well, cars and bikes, uh, all sorts of different things have reflectors to make these vehicles more visible at night. Here we have a reflector um, in which hundreds of tiny flat reflecting surfaces are all arranged at 90 degree angles to one another. This is really, really cool. Uh, the way that reflectors actually work. These many small surfaces are packed side by side to make the reflector. When light from another vehicle hits the reflector, the light bounces off the many tiny surfaces back towards the source of the light. The driver or other vehicle sees the reflection and realizes that something is ahead, so that that way, no matter where the light is coming from, because all of these different reflecting surfaces are at different angles to one another, that will always be able to bounce straight back to wherever the light's coming from, causing it to be illuminated or causing it to become brighter. This is kind of the, the cool science behind reflectors and how reflectors use the law of reflection in order to create lots of different reflecting surfaces in order to make it more visible when light hits it. However, we use reflection in a lot of different other ways, too. Think about the game of pool, for example. Now, not swimming pool, but uh, the game of pool or billiards here. Pool players can use the law of reflection to help improve their game. Like a light ray, a pool ball travels in a straight line until it strikes something. In a bank shot, however, the white cue ball here is going to bounce off the side or off the cushion before it has to strike the target ball. And if you've ever played pool, you know that you can specifically make sure to change the angle that you're going to bounce it off the side in order to try to hit that ball using, guess what, the laws of reflection. And based on the angle that you hit that side wall, you should be able to predict the exact angle that it's going to come back so that hopefully you can have a pretty accurate shot. To decide where to aim the cue ball against the cushion, the player chooses a spot that is the same distance behind, that is the same distance behind the cushion as the target ball is in front of it. So for example, if you wanted to hit this target ball here, right, you want to basically uh, think about a straight line as if there's an image of the ball here. It's crazy how even in the world of science, even in the world of uh, just playing pool, there's a lot of actual math that is involved, a lot of geometry that's involved. And obviously as a math person, I, I love that as well. The spot is the image of the target ball. And the player now shoots the cue ball towards that image, hoping that it will bounce off the cushion at the same angle at which it strikes, thereby hitting the target ball itself. This is how reflection works. We use it in mirrors, but we use it in all sorts of other ways too, in which light and different objects have the opportunity to bounce off of a particular surface. In our next videos, we're going to start taking a look at what happens if that light doesn't just bounce off that surface, but what happens if it actually goes through? And we're going to start moving from reflection to something called refraction.